Good morning and most welcome to 1353 of the Heidegger series and today we will take up an article by Rudolf Gachea, the famous Derrida and Heidegger interpreter and renowned philosopher of Luxembourgian descent. The name of the article is Ford Ideality in Fragmentation. There will be a link in the description for you to download if you want to follow directly. Forward Ideality in Fragmentation by Rudolf Gachea. Just a series of writing and on the multiplicity of the text have gained hold in the field of literary studies over the last two decades. So also has the assumption that an inescapable fragmentation has always already gotten the best of the idea of totality associated with the book. The oeuvre, the opus, and so on. Undoubtedly, these theories aim at conceptually making sense of a destruction of the book that has not only been under the way for some time but also has affected more domains than merely literary And yet, it is generally taken for granted that fragmentation and fragmentary writing capture the energy and the effects of the disruption by writing. The complex of referrals and the inner multiplicity constitutive of the text
denuded in the destruction that is taking place. Whether the very concept of the fragment as well as its history is indeed sufficient to describe the form of the more significant literary experiments. from uh, the late 19th century up to the present, as well as to conceptualize the intrinsic difference heterogeneity. Plurality and so forth of the text has to my knowledge never been attended explicitly. What should be obvious is that if the fragment or rather its notion is to bring out the radical atotality of writing or the text It must be a notion of fragment thoroughly distinct from its prevailing notions. concept of the fragment that merely emphasizes incompletion, residualness, detachment or brokenness will not serve here.
pace struck by incompletion, a detached pace, a pace left over from a broken hole. or even an erratic piece. Is structurally linked with a whole or totality of which it would have been or of which it has been a part. Such a fragment is a piece of an ensemble, possible or constituted at one point. It receives its very meaning from that ensemble that it thus posits and presupposes rather than challenges. Yet more often than not, this is the concept of fragment and fragmentation. that one encounters in texts of criticism where reference is made to the disruption of totality by writing and textuality. It is the classical pre-romantic concept of the fragment. More promising, therefore, might be the early German Romantic reflections on this notion.
indeed much of the renewed interest in the writings of Friedrich Schlegel and Novalis is based to a large extent on the premise that the early Romantics theory and practice of the fragment prefigure the discoveries associated with contemporary theories on writing and textuality. It is uh, the classical pre-romantic concept of the fragment. More promising, therefore, might be the early German re romantic reflections on this notion. Indeed, much of the renewed interest in the writings of Friedrich Schlegel and Novalis is based to a large extent on the premise that the early Romantics theory and practice of the fragment prefigure the discoveries associated with contemporary theories on writing and textuality. Although, although the early Romantics fragment is still indebted to the history of a genre that must be traced back to Montaigne's essay
Rascals, Foncé, and the entire tradition of the English and French moralists. It is well established that Friedrich Schlegel introduced the form of the fragment into German literature after the strong impression he received from the publication in 1795 of Chamfort Pensée. Maxime et un octote. The romantic fragment is not a pensée. Maxime, saying, opinion, anecdote, or remark. all of which are marked by only relative incompletion and which receive their unity from the subject who has authored them. Although Friedrich Schlegel refers to it as the Chamfortian form, the romantic fragment is, as Philippe Lacou Labart and Jean Luc Nancy have shown. A determinate and deliberate statement assuming or transfiguring the accidental and involuntary aspects of fragmentation. The romantic fragment aims at fragmentation for its own sake.
rather than a peace to be understood from the whole of which it would be a remainder or a broken part. The romantic fragment is a genre by itself, characterized by a concept of its own. This concept, rather than the romantic fragments, literary, rhetorical or stylistic form, It is indeed questionable whether the very concept of the romantic fragment is ever enacted on the level of the signifier. is what shall concern us hereafter. by analyzing in some detail what this concept amounts to. It must be noted that the fragments that embody what later came to be known as the romantic literary ideal were written in an amazingly short period of time. During the two years from 1798 to 1800s, that the Atenum lasted. and are also largely the result of Friedrich Schlegel's obsession with the genre.
against the sometimes overt hostility on the part of the other members of the group, including his own brother. to practice the fragmentary genre and to publish more fragments in the journal. Friedrich stubbornly maintained the romantic exigency. It is thanks to this determination by a single person Friedrich Schlegel and his engrossment with the form in the question that there exists a romantic genre at all. Deeply personal reasons seem to have motivated him in pursuing this ideal. Namely, the difficulty to which many critics have pointed. In disciplining his intellectual energy. Moreover, a discrepancy between his creative abilities and his monumental plans added to his developing habit, developing a habit of jotting down his thoughts at the moment they occurred. As a result, Friedrich Schlegel filled notebook after notebook with notes 
written on the spur of the moment. Indeed, the fragments published between 1798 and 1800 critical fragments, the Anatean fragments, and the ideas. Constitute only a very small part of the ensemble of his attempts to catch his burgeoning thoughts at the moment of their genesis. By the time of his death, <clears throat> approximately 180 notebooks existed, half of which have survived. The Chamfortian genre, with its demand for concise expression, had therefore to become the ideal and the most appropriate literary form for fixing and communicating the inexorable flow of thoughts. But this very same excess of thought also more often than not prevented Schlegel from fine-tuning his notes in accordance with the form of the fragment. More often than not, prevented Schlegel from fine tuning his notes in accordance with the form of the fragment. In Maurice Blanchot's words, The 
fragments often appear to be for Schlegel a complacent self-indulgence rather than the attempt to elaborate a more rigorous mode of writing. Yet the paradox remains that although Schlegel's fragments are of uneven value, rarely even distinguishable from maxims, aphorisms, notes, thoughts, opinions, and remarks. They were to become the manifesto of the romantic exigen exigency. What we have advanced as reasons for Schlegel's personal predilection for the genre in no way explain that fate. Moreover, the fact that these fragments only rarely conform in style and form to the fragmentary, fragmentary exigency itself. makes their success even more intriguing. The question I would like to raise here then concerns an additional reason that would explain the thrust Schlegel's fragments were to acquire. As I will argue, this other reason lies in Schlegel's encounter with Kant. More precisely, it is from the recounter between a characteristic weakness in Schlegel that is his inability to develop and systematically present his insight insights and to carry out 
his innumerable projects. And Kant's theory of the transcendental ideas that the exigency or concept of fragmentation was born. It is this encounter that God's writing fragmentarily from becoming the mere reflection of Schlegel's own discord or disorder. And that allows the fragment to have a closure other than the perfect sentence of the aphorism. If the romantic fragment achieves the task of introducing, in Blanchot's terms, a totally new mode of fulfillment, accomplissement, and this becomes rigorously possible only through a cross fertilization between the romantics practice of writing and the Kantian doctrine. which, as we shall see, deals with the universal conditions of completion. It is certainly true that the Romantics did not explicitly developed a theory of the fragment. There is no such theory to be found in the published fragments but they contain an ongoing reflection on the very concept of the fragment. In the literary absolute, Lacou, Labarthe and Nancy 
have argued in a manner consistent with what Walter Benjamin already suggested in his dissertation, Der Begriff der Kunstkritik in der Deutschen Romantik. That although it is not entirely or simply philosophical, Romanticism is rigorously comprehensible or even accessible only on a philosophical basis. in its proper and, in fact, unique in other words, entirely new articulation with the philosophical If I contend that the fragments attempt to elaborate a concept of the fragment, a concept that remains clearly discrepant from the literary devices on which the written fragments rely. It is also to make the point that the romantic fragment is a philosophical conception. So I will make a little afterthought of the text. It's still not enough to make a summary. But the fragments are occurring at this period of time. And they are characterized by being small pieces and Schlegel's own insight that he wanted to make a bigger whole, a wholesome and directed work is typical for what was recurring in the late 18th century. It is as almost like mind itself started to become fragmented. I felt it was rather amazing that he got up to 180 notebooks all fragmented, not put together, or his renowned inability to do the same thing. It's a bit early to make conclusions, but I do think of Kantir which he was in contact with. Kant, 
fragments experience in categories. They are all different. And he also goes to the very core of experience, life, outer, inner, and he cuts it in half. One is before the a priori, and one is after the a posteriori. That is in itself a fragmentation. And I would say it's a maturity of a tendency that started much earlier. Ripping apart, putting different levels, and in the end, mind slash world becomes fragmented. Maybe there is a question. I do apologize for not having a whiteboard. Would help with the timeline. Hello, hello. I would like to compare the fragments with the contemporary ruins and Swedish you have a name, Ruin Romantique. In English, Romantic Ruins, that is the English root. Embellish the gardens with ruins, that is, they could put a Greek or Roman column there. That is, the, um, there was already a ruin that they intentionally imitated a uh, imitated decay because ruin is, is a symptom of a decay. Um, the uh, the uh, English were not content of admiring Greek and Roman temples in decay. They also wanted to reproduce the very decay. And the fragments are a reflection of that spirit. Um, aesthetically, I find the ruins very beautiful. But, as you say, Hans, perhaps they also are sad statement of the mind. Um, I don't know yet, might be so. So, what, what have you seen any ruins? What could you say about the ruins? Can you compare them to the fragments? Yes, definitely. They are very typical for fragmentization, decay, and this sense of loss. But also, as you say, they became appreciated. And so did the fragments of Schlegel. We got Maybe you can say, we got used to the situation and we had to make do. Appreciation is part of, my take on it is, the appreciation is part of it. It drives the development to fragmentization even more. And to put in an almost absurd example from modern day. Even melodies that were already fragmented in the 20th century, at the end of the 20th century, they turn into bits and pieces, as you can find in hip hop. Different melodies, pieces of Mozart, interrupted by cries, shouting and a staccato voice. And this is appreciated. 
it is a change of mind. It is a bit like being fragmented and therefore you also are habituated into it. This is your Umwelt and Lebensform. I put a little pause here. So we continue with the reading of Rudolf Gachet's article. With the foregoing references to Der Begriff der Kunstkritik and the literary absolute, I have made it evident from what angle I shall broach the problematic of the romantic fragment. I shall approach its problematic from a philosophical perspective, armed, as it were, with a thesis that if, de if developed further than I can hope to do here, would complement the analysis and findings by Benjamin and the authors of the literary absolute. Traditionally, Jena Romanticism has been traced back to Fichte's transcendental philosophy. Benjamin still follows that line of interpretation when he seeks to demarcate the revolutionary conceptions of the early Romantics from Weimar Classicism. It is certainly the case that Fichte exercised a decisive influence on the theoreticians of Romanticism. Schlegel's first notebooks are a clear sign of their preoccupation with Fichte's thought. And so are Novalis studies on Fichte. But 
however illuminating such derivation of romanticism from Fichte's metaphysics may be. It does not allow for a clear recognition of the originality of the position. What is truly new about it can come into view only if romantic thought is seen to arise. as does Fichte's metaphysics. From possibilities opened up in Kant's philosophy. originality of the literary absolute has been to argue that rather than merely applying some schemes found in Kant and transforming them in some original fashion Early Romanticism represents together and in distinction from idealism properly speaking And the thought of Holderlin, a third genuinely new philosophical position in the aftermath of critical philosophy. With these two other positions, early Romanticism shares in spite of all the differences the first stages of idealism. namely the task of completion in the strongest sense of the word. The goal is to have done with partition and division, with a separation constitutive of history. The goal is to construct, to produce, to effectuate what 
even at the origin of history was already thought of as a lost and forever inaccessible golden age. But as we shall see, <clears throat> the originality of the romantic position consisted in arguing that such completion could always be achieved only in a singular and finite way. It is this paradox around which the romantic theory revolves. According to which the universal can be achieved only in a manner that is each time singular. that led the early romantics to consider art as a paradigm for thought. And to conceive of philosophy as accomplishing itself as art. Yet although this unique philosophical position arises from possibilities opened up by Kant's philosophical legacy, Neither Benjamin nor the authors of the literary absolute have tried to clarify what these possibilities are. Benjamin explicitly puts aside any discussion concerning the relation between romantic and Kantian theories of art. as beyond the scope of his monography, whereas 
la queue la barthe, and Nancy largely assume the reader's familiarity with these possibilities. I shall develop here the thesis that the romantic position and in particular the theory of fragmentation is understandable only if it is seen to derive, elaborate on and enact a series of implications that follow from Kant's reflection on the presentability of ideas. Before taking up this problematic I shall characterize the romantic position in some detail. First, however, this fragmentation does not exclude systematic intention and exposition. If this is indeed the case, It is not primarily because any reading of the fragments reveals an indisputability coherent system of thought. Does the fact that the romantic romantics practice continuous genres as well? That is properly theoretical expositions of their doctrine. explain this link between fragment and system.
fragmentation and systematic intentions are not exclusive for fundamental reasons. A fragment in the romantic sense is the only possible presentation they could conceive of the system. Do you note know that is rather interesting? The romantic's conception takes place within the horizon of the notion of a system that they inherit and revive through a reflection on its presentability. In the often quoted Athenaeum fragment 53, Schlegel notes that it's equally fatal for the mind to have a system and to have none. It will simply have to decide to combine the two. If the system is, according to the way many philosophers think, a regiment of soldiers on parade, then it is fatal for the mind. Yet, without systematic exigency, thought does not live up to its concept and remains stuck with the manifold. In literary notebooks, Schlegel remarks, All philosophy 
that is not systematical is rhapsodic. In other words, it is an ensemble of unconnected pieces merely stitched together. On the other hand, he continues every system is a rhapsody of masses and a mass of rhapsodies. Now, the idea of the system is nothing less than the idea of totality. Totality is the systematic idea. Yet, even the greatest system is merely a fragment. The in inevitable exigency of the system can thus be achieved only in a manner that is fragmentary. But it is nothing less than the system that takes shape in the fragment. By combining system and fragment in this fashion, the Romantics were able to avoid the dogmatic and sclerotic connotations that come 
with the notion of the system. and fragment in this fashion. Oh, sorry. With a notion of the system and to ward off the specter of abstraction associated with system building. While supporting at the same time the traditional demand. This intrinsic relation of system and fragment has the additional meaning that all fragments are systems in use. In Athenium Fragment 206, we read A fragment like a miniature work of art has to be entirely isolated from the surrounding world and be complete in itself like a porcupine. Fragments are individuals, singular organic totalities, that is, systems in miniatures. I add a remark, atoms here. As the literary notebooks remark, the more organic something is, the more systematic it is. The system is not so much a species of form as the essence of the work itself. And do note here, form and essence. Or a system alone 
is properly a work. In short then, the following equation pertains Fragment equals system equals work equals individual. It would thus seem that Schlegel confines the synthetic power of absolute unity to the punctual, punctual entities of the fragment alone. In the closed off individualities of the fragment, unity is achieved in chaos. But at the expense of any systematic relation as the absoluteness or isolation of the fragment suggests. A lack of coherence or of a systesy, as Schelling called it, would characterize the fragmentary universe but as Athenaeum fragments two for two holds All individuals are systems at least in embryo and tendency. They are the seeds for future systems.
Schlegel indeed uses the term project synonymously with fragment. Peter Jondi has noted that the fragment is conceived as the subjective embryo of a developing object. That is, as preparation of the long for synthesis. Rather than the not yet achieved or what has remained a detached piece, the fragment is perceived as anticipation, promise. The fragmentary universe, however incoherent, is thus made up of entities heavy with potential systems. But these fragments, complete in themselves as individualities, yet incomplete at the same time in that they are only embryos of developing systems. isolated and yet striving at a whole are not simply without all systematic relation. Even if the fragment is the failing expression of totality, as Manfred Frank has argued, it can be understood as such only If nonetheless, none, nonetheless, it has its place in the negative frame of a system.
as a matter of fact, does not Schlegel himself suggest that systems are made up entirely of fragments. Do note that there is a preference for thinking in that way. They appreciate it, appreciated it. It was also what they wanted. And on my comment. More important, however, In the following, Ideas 48 claims that every thinking part of an organization should not feel its limits without at the same time feeling its unity in relation to the whole. Indeed, if idea is for Schlegel another concept for fragment, Then fragments like ideas point toward the heart of things. Or more precisely, toward the center, toward what orients all individual things? The fragments thus long for a higher unity, but this higher unity, the system of fragments, is itself made up again of a chain or garland of fragments. In other words, the higher unity that the fragments long for and that they contain with themselves, within themselves as a seed, is only another individuality. Schlegel writes in Athenium 
fragment two or two. Good. Aren't all systems individuals just as all individuals are systems at least in embryo and tendency? Consequently, the totality that is sought by the fragment is an always singular totality. A totality that is therefore also necessarily plural and thus incomplete. To conclude, fragmentation constitutes the properly romantic vision of the system. It conceives of the absolute under the form of the individual. Act of totality as being at the same time finite and plural. But this is not yet all. If fragmentation is indeed the romantic vision of the system, it is because system for the romantics means not the so-called systematic ordering of an ensemble but that by which and as which an ensemble holds together and establishes itself for itself in the autonomy of the self jointure. So in the text it becomes established here that the vision, the preferred vision of Schlegel and the party in the Ateneum was that the fragments are what constitutes, are the desired thing. You see, intellect, want, aesthetic ideals, morality, and of course, as we already know, science, how to rule a society.
all goes into the same direction and it's so eloquently and still very concisely put this is the preferred mood this is what they wanted their wish is part of the fragmentation it is not an isolate they defend it it's a bit early to say and I suppose maybe a bit exaggerated but the whole Kantian philosophy could be the theoretical structures that support these ideals that would for the romantics be perceived as the good thing the state to be in and here, of course, I deviate a bit from the original idea in, for instance, the philosophy of history that Kant produced the fragmentation. I think I would say it's a joint journey romantics, the people of the time, and the philosophers, sort of strengthening their ideas and pushing fragmentation further and further. The area that I especially want to point, my personal experience, is the music of the time as to compare to the earlier music of the Baroque. For some reason, if you listen to the music of the later period, at the first instant, music of, for instance, Handel, can for your soul, your perceiving agency, be felt as fragmentary, not as wholesome. But when you get into it, when your mood is changing, you feel, although, especially in, in some of the tunes, there are so many competing melodies, overlaying each other almost fractally but when you become fractal yourself you feel a sense of stillness and widening a calmness whereas I would say in the later music Beethoven on the surface, I would say it feels exactly as described here. It's a totality. But then somehow you notice there is a tendency that that totality is the sum. Of the entities, of the fragments. It is, of course, a sliding line further into history, coming into the music of the 19th century. The superficial wholeness becomes even more pushing. There's another feature there I want to point as the superficial wholeness, for instance, in Mendelssohn, becomes more apparent. It becomes sticky, stickier, a word often used by E. McKilchrist, 
it sticks to your mind. This is vaguely parallel to a catchy melody or a jingle that you can't resist. It's in that area. Of course, Mendelssohn, I will not compare him to a jingle, but it's a, it's a scale that goes in a certain direction. Confirmed and pushed by everyone and appreciated. Almost like you get used to the crowdedness and it becomes your Lebensraum that you aggressively defend, which is, I would say, maybe the ideology of the Athenium. Maybe there's a question coming up here. Hmm? I hand the microphone over to my dear colleague. So I do it in this direction. Hello, hello. I will um, repeat one phrase in this paper. This is a quote, quotation from uh, Slegel. All individuals are systems, at least in embryo and tendency. End quotation. And I think this third embryo is important. Uh, as you men mentioned earlier, atom. So embryo and atom, the close related subjects is the small, 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 small thing. And um, uh, I agree with you. And, and you could compare uh, with another idea. Development. Embryo is in contrast to development. And as you said uh, many times that the modern university system condemns or kills development or knowledge. Knowledge and um, development are the same thing, more or less. Yeah. Because um, the idea that Schlegel and others have, like also Richard Dawkins, is that you are already ready in the embryo, that the cell is everything. And they're okay, at the expense of development. Um, of course, Kant and other philosophers 